Hello folks, welcome to Santa Clarita in the Middle, a podcast where we, guided by our co-hosts, try to figure out where our little slice of America is going and how we got here. Joining me in this journey is our very own Gretchen Zovac, Army veteran and small business owner. Hello Gretchen. Hi there. And with us also is another Santa Clarita resident, Ryan Painter, USC student and local journalist. Hello Ryan. Good to be with you. Excellent. This show will feature a few stories from local news sources and is graciously sponsored by California Institute of the Arts, one of the top art schools in the world, located right here in Santa Clarita. Check out their new Discover Music program, Cal Arts Summer Program for high school students. Learn more at calarts.edu slash discover, and let's get on with the show. Ryan, you wrote about a uh, candidate that is now running for the congressional seat in the 25th. Yeah, so about two weeks ago, I was very lucky to get about 45 minutes with Suzette Valladares who grew up in Silmar, now lives in the district in Acton, and is challenging Katie Hill uh, to be the congressional representative from the 25th district in the 2020 election. What did you think of your interactions with her? It was interesting. I was impressed. She was very kind. She was very affable. She spoke a lot, which is something you always want as a journalist. Um, She really portrayed herself as a moderate, someone who could represent a purple district, but at the same time, seemed to take some some pretty different stances than Katie Hill and seemed to contextualize herself in a different light than Katie Hill, particularly on the border and on health care. So I think it'll be interesting to see how that plays out, this dynamic of her wanting to represent a purple district, but also taking some pretty partisan stances at the same time. She seemed like she was pretty not in favor of Katie Hill being a Democrat, just in general, not necessarily listening to the to the voters. Or she she had a lot of the Democrats this the Dem- at least the story had a lot of Democrats this and Democrats that and aren't representing us. Well, it, she's just another one that's jumping on one side of the partisan line, which you guys know drives me insane. <laughs> but Katie Hill won the election, right? And her. The Democrats or the independents and the Democrats voted her in in this district. So is it her duty to represent those people or her duty to, you know, see to the historical implications of this this district and vote conservative or moderate? Yeah, I think that's a really key question. And I think to to be quite honest, I think it's too early to start answering that question. Mm -hmm. I think she was sworn in in January. It's mid-April. Congress hasn't done that much yet. So to go out there with this narrative that she's not representing the district adequately, that she's a lockstep Democrat, that she votes intransigently with Nancy Pelosi and Ocasio-Cortez and some of these more progressives, I think that might not entirely be false at this time, but also just not that much legislation has happened yet. So let's kind of wait and see. Let's maybe give it six months before we really assess that because not much has gone down yeah, yet so how could you draw that conclusion especially so since right. she took office in the middle of a shutdown right and, and so for you know the first it took month, it took a yeah. long time before they yeah. could even get the money to set up their they, she yeah. still didn't even have her offices set up yet yeah and um you know but then on the other hand you know they're going she's going to get painted with the pelosi brush no matter of course what of because course. she's not she's what she's the freshman rep on the leadership yeah. team yeah so I mean, everybody's, she's Nancy Pelosi's little pet freshman, essentially. And that's, you know, they're going to run against her like that. And I sure as hell hope she's ready for it. Right. One of the things that really interested me about Valladara's um, announcement is that she is really in support of uh, people with special disabilities and issues of that nature, and especially children, children's issues. Um, kind of reminded me a lot of another elected representative we have in this area, uh, Christy Smith, who also is came, comes from like an educational background. Um, did that stick out to you guys as maybe interesting? That might be another cross section of voters that she might be able to speak to because this is a very family centric centric town, and we just elected two very young officials to represent us, both in mm-hmm. Sacramento and in D.C. I'm not sure about that. I mean, um, Christie's an entirely different animal. You than, know? than Katie Hill than, is, yeah. Than, mm-hmm. than Katie or, you know, Vayadara is any, you know, it's, they're, Christie is, is 
I don't know anyone who dislikes Christy. I mean, maybe Dante Acosta. <laughs> <laughs> you definitely speak for Dante. Well, she's I, also... thought, I thought it was funny that he filed his papers just like two weeks after the election. <laughs> He's already going to try and get his seat Yeah, during back. the waterboard. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he, he filed the papers trying to run against Christy again. I, I'm not sure that's that might be ill-advised. But you but gotta do what you got to do. Do you think... The Viadar's announcement that she's going to campaign on children's issues and special um, needs is going to reach maybe a different audience than the people that Katie Hill has spoken to so far. Because I, uh, from my point of view, where I sit, I haven't seen Katie Hill really do anything that reaches out to children's needs or um, those kinds of issues. Yeah, I would say not necessarily. I think it's kind of unfortunate because I think those issues are incredibly important and have wide-ranging implications for us. But I think at the same time, they're not really hot-button issues. Like, everyone can agree that we need adequate funding for kids with autism. No one's going to disagree about that. So it's not really very salient. No one has... There's no conflict over that. But is there a real constituency there? And that's that's a good point as well. I, I don't know if that's enough, really, to to draw voters in because I don't think there's any politician that would say the opposite. I don't think there's any politician that would say, no, screw the kids. Like, right. (laughs) I I don't want them to be funded. So I feel like even though it's something that she's incorporating into her campaign, I don't know if it's enough to lift her above the fold. And she indicated to me that she was also planning to campaign very heavily on immigration, on small businesses and on healthcare all of those are a lot more divisive. There's much larger cleavage. But she also there. wants to build a wall. Yes. And yeah, that does, is she insanity. Does. She's I don't know that she, she's gonna get anywhere with that in Southern California. I don't care what district. It, it was in. interesting because she she was very reticent to tell me that she would have voted in favor of, of building the wall. That was something I had to clarify with her quite a few times because she kept kind of saying this this same platitude that we've heard from Katie Hill a lot, to be honest, of well, I support increased border security. And so I kind of pushed back and said, all right, well, what does that mean? Substantively, what does increased border security mean? Because Katie Hill has said that almost verbatim Mm -hmm. multiple times. And she kind of just sort of kept repeating that until I, I finally asked to clarify. So, okay, had you been in Congress instead of Katie Hill in January, would you have voted for Donald Trump's $5.6 billion to fund the building of the wall. And she said yes. So I think it's something that she does support, but I think it's not necessarily something that she's trying to Yeah, that's, see, that's it. To, like to that highlight right there. or to, um, bring, to bring to the front. Yeah, that's, I, that's something that she really shouldn't be talking about like right now because a lot of people just did their taxes. I mean, it was harsh this year. Yeah, I mean, those yeah. Trump tax cuts were definitely not... <laughs> not <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't help me any in my tax bracket. <laughs> right. So, I mean, that hurt this year. So, you know, giving Trump $5.6 billion for a wall? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Not this year, you know? I mean, I'm trying to figure out, when I read this story that Ryan wrote in The Proclaimer, I'm trying to figure out where this candidate doesn't align with the Republican Party. And the only thing that I can really find see that is unique about her is that the children's issue, the children's special needs mm-hmm. issue. Um, everything else sounds to me like it lines up almost one for one with the Republican platform that's going on right now. And so if she's criticizing Katie on the other side for mm-hmm. being uh, a lockstep, lockstep Democrat. Step, yeah. And which is not going to get her anywhere either mm-hmm. because the, the Republicans ran against Nancy Pelosi in the midterms and they got spanked. Well, and I think this is sort of going to be the paradox of this election in a purple district here is all of these, can- every single candidate so far has said, I'm going to be a moderate. I'm not going to vote with the party line. I'm going to vote for whatever proposal is best for this district. But that's how Katie wants And they too. say that, right, of course. And they say that. But then at the same time, Vaidaris is a lifelong Republican. She's worked for the RNC. She worked for Buck McKeon. And so I think I wouldn't be surprised if, if she were elected she would perform similarly to Katie Hill. And, and I don't necessarily fault either. I mean, Katie Hill is a Democrat. Vyadar is a Republican. People vote with their party. That is to be expected. But I think sort of this major theme that's being incorporated into their campaigns that, okay, we're going to 
we're going to vote for whatever benefits this valley, not irrespective of, of which party proposed that piece of legislation. And I just think that doesn't work in reality. It's I think that's realistic. really easy to say during the campaign. And this is not to fault Valladares. This is not to fault Hill. I, I think it's the right thing to say, but I think it's much easier said than done. It definitely is. It, it might get you elected, but it's going to come back on you after, mm-hmm. after it does. Yeah. Hi, folks. If you like this content and would like to support what we do, please visit donate.radiofreesanacarita.org to make a donation. And speaking of donations, this podcast is brought to you by a generous sponsorship of Radio Free Santa Clarita from California Institute of the Arts, one of the top art schools in the world, located right here in Santa Clarita. Check out their new Discover Music program, Cal Arts Summer Program for High School Students. Learn more at calarts.edu slash discover. Welcome back to Santa Clarita in the Middle. We are also going to discuss another candidate that has jumped into the race for California's 25th on the Republican side, Mike Garcia. Brennan Dixon wrote about Garcia in a feature in the Santa Clarita Signal. You each read the piece. What did you think about it? I have read it. I think it's another Republican talking smack about Democrats. (laughs) In general, it's all Democrats. Yeah, did you read the article? It's, It's all about Democrats this, Democrats that. It's, he's going to run against Nancy Pelosi, not against Katie Hill. And then he's going to take the heavy uh, veteran population in his district and say, yeah, vote for me because I'm a veteran, period. Mm-hmm. And I noticed the, the article did not ask him, what are you going to do for veterans? Because that would be my first question. What are you going to do for me? And Knight had an answer for that. Only the fact is Knight never really backed it up. Knight consistently voted down stuff that would have helped veterans and, you know, just to toe the party line. And sorry, we can't get you. We'll get you next time. Yeah, sorry, we'll get you next time. That's That's been what veterans have been dealing with for years, you know. Right. Since and, we lost Buck McCann or? But even during Buck McCann's, he was, he, he bordered on Tea Party at, at certain times, you know, toward the end there. And they didn't want to spend money on anything. Any government spending was not cool. And also, Buck McKeon wasn't really that geared toward veterans. He was geared toward active duty military. He was geared toward keeping those jobs at Boeing and Lockheed up in Palmdale. He was all about that. But as far as veterans, we're almost considered a charity case. I mean, I talked to a Vietnam veteran very recently, Republican, Trump fan, you know, whatever. Um, he doesn't even think that veteran services should be available to all veterans, just those who really need it. Well, okay, but that's not what it says on the contract when you sign, you know? Right. Um, so they're, you know, the, all these, these fiscal conservatives are all about, you know, well, you know, we'll see if we can afford it. But, you know, I, I think that's not the kind of contract we make with uh, people when they do volunteer to put their life on the line. Yeah. I didn't really see anything in this article, this interview with Mike Garcia, that really stuck out to me as anything different than representatives we've had before and Steve Knight and maybe Buck McKeon. He is endorsed by Buck McKeon, so Mm -hmm. there's a chance that he'll be on the Armed Services Committee or something like that. Maybe he'll have some sort of a higher role. Maybe the Republican conference would like to, because Katie Hill is part of the leadership committee, put someone else up there from this district to hold the seat. But I didn't see anything in here that really stuck out to me as like, this is a good reason that I might want to support this candidate. Yeah, so going off that, I had the opportunity to speak with him last week for an upcoming story. And I did actually ask him about Steve Knight because there are quite a few similarities between the two. Steve Knight ran on a very heavy veteran platform of, of portraying himself as a veteran. And Garcia is doing, I didn't mean that derisively, I'm sorry, I meant in, uh, he, he, he highlighted his service as a reason to vote for him. And Garcia is doing something similar. And Garcia was a fighter pilot. Uh, Steve Knight is the son of Pete Knight, who holds the all-time record for fastest flight ever in an aircraft out of Edwards. So, so there's a lot of similarities between the two. And when I asked him about it, he 
responded with these really laudatory remarks about Steve Knight, how he was a great American and how he really stood behind Steve Knight and thought what he was doing was great. And even though Steve Knight lost, he, he didn't necessarily think that that was a bad thing. It, it seemed almost like he was adopting and sort of appropriating a lot of aspects of Knight's candidacy and Knight's platform in general. One of the things I, that I saw in the article was he talks about just the idea of running against Katie Hill as some sort of a noble task mm-hmm. that, mm-hmm. you know, he, he, he says, I couldn't sit on the sidelines anymore, so I decided to run. And I just don't... Katie Hill's been, like we talked about a little bit before, Katie Hill's only been in office for less than six months. What is so normal? Less than four months. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what is yeah. so imperative yeah. to get back in, get in the race again and turn the seat back over to a Republican? She's barely had a chance to do anything in the Congress. And it's a divided government right now anyways. So what are we really changing by electing someone else when we barely give a shot to the person that we already have there? Yeah, so I was really trying to push him during the interview on that, on getting to tell me, okay, so why? So we understand that you don't think Katie Hill is doing a very good job in office and that you should be the one to replace her. But in what areas exactly is she failing and what could you do differently? And there wasn't a lot of policy substance. Unlike Valladares, who had this lengthy page on her website that talked about, in in a moderate amount of detail, a, a bunch of her different policy planks and platforms... Uh, Garcia has no such thing on his website, at least he didn't as of a week ago when I spoke with him. And when I asked him about some key issues like healthcare, for example, he essentially told me that he didn't really have a a defined position or a defined policy prescription at this point and that I should ask him again in the future and he'll have a stance on healthcare. I think there was a lot of, a lot of talk about veterans And he mentioned to me that he wants to be in Congress so that he can make Americans more patriotic again and so that Americans can start to respect law enforcement more again. And I wasn't I wasn't entirely sure what he meant by that, but it certainly didn't appear to be supplemented with any substantial policy positions. Will you do me an actual favor? (laughs) When you talk to these guys and they say, Oh, you know, you you ask for what's if they say veterans this and veterans that, say, what exactly do you mean by that? Yeah, I you will. Know, say, you well. are a veteran, and it's but very well. you're, have you ever used veteran services? Do you know what it's like to be, you know, a disabled a vet right. who needs to, you know, who needs treatment or, you know, needs to get through school or, you know, and is depending on the VA to do all this? Have you ever used these services and how are you going to make it better for those who do yeah those you know? are because that's one thing that's one thing Knight questions. could never connect with i, I asked questions. him lots of times have you ever used these services he's like oh well i've been on the bus that we i'm like no 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 <laughs> that's not what i'm talking about and like have you ever been dependent on the va to get you through school have you uh, anything you know have you ever been to the you know the medical clinic as a patient mm. you know even once and he hadn't so and they, and he's not in office anymore. Yeah. So so you know maybe you. maybe now he'll need you. Going back to that, like elected officials who don't do much for veterans. I mean, what has Katie Hill really done for veterans? Absolutely time? nothing. Nothing, right? In fact, you know, the even the the liberal vets out here it came unglued when that uh, pack started. You know, doing like a strong new voice for veterans. As her father was a veteran, and her grandfather was a veteran. Whoa. And she's a strong new voice for veterans. We were like, ah, no, that is not how you, you don't get to do that. I'm sorry that we all have veterans in our families. You don't get to claim that you know anything about (laughs) veterans. Just be, no, no, right. No, no, no. Well, I think, and I I wonder too, if Palmdo and Lancaster weren't in the 25th district, I wonder if veterans would even be mentioned at all. A serious because oh, as important as it is, it doesn't get discussed as much in the national discourse as things like healthcare, immigration. Like mm-hmm. those are the hot button issues right now. And so I wonder if the 25th district gets reapportioned in 2020, and if it 
cuts out Palmdale and Lancaster, I wonder if, if Katie Hill would even be saying those things. I mean, for someone like Garcia, it makes sense because he was a veteran, so of course mm. he would want to use that. And I don't know what his stances are with respect to that. I don't know what he plans to do for veterans, but I wouldn't doubt that it's something that he does care about. He did serve his country, but, but I wonder about candidates who didn't serve, if they would still be even really mentioning veteran services at all, if this huge bastion of defense spending and, and veterans didn't I exist in the district. Probably. I mean, we, in, even in Santa Clarita, you go, I mean, there are pictures of veterans on the, on That's the true. streets. And, and you know, I'm, like I'm not saying we're, they're not they're, important we're, we're a very, you know, veteran heavy. I'm just saying too. it tends to be a consensus issue because no side wants to come out on the opposite and say, Oh no, I don't support veterans. Mm-hmm. Every candidate right. is always, of course, I support it's veterans. Kind of like what they, we talked about before with special right, needs, right? With the kids, with the you kids. You have to be on. So that I, side. I just wonder if it would still be. Of course, it's always an issue, and veterans should be entitled to all the services that they should have in, in exchange for defending our country. But I, I wonder how salient that issue would be if we were a district that didn't really have as huge of a military connection as we do with Edwards Air Force Base and all the, mm. all the contractors in the Antelope Valley. Yeah, no, nowhere near as much, but, I mean, it is what it is. I don't think we're yeah. going to... I think we'll lose Simi Valley before we lose uh, Palmdale and Lancaster, hmm. part of our district. Because there, yeah, there really right. isn't anywhere well, the else... the county line. Yeah, there really isn't weird. anywhere yeah. close enough to Palmdale yeah. and Lancaster to, uh, yeah. to group them yeah. in with, and they can't be their own district, so... No, they're not large enough. Right. Um, but... You know, I think, yeah, I think they'll they'll probably yeah. Cut out. And, and I think it's a little I mean, awkward. Did you know we have a little chunk me. of Northridge and Shaftworth too? Yeah, we, yeah, we have like a couple weird. streets. Yeah, like, yeah. So we, I mean, we have like north of the one eighteen through the valley right. in the in the twenty fifth district. Yeah, which is so. also weird. But I I would have a feeling that yeah. we would lose uh, Simi Valley before we. Yeah, I, I think so because of the county Valley. issue. It's, it's weird that the district has L.A. and Ventura counties. Right. I think they'd want to consolidate it more. Mm-hmm. One of the things that Mike brings up in his in his interview with Brandon Dixon is that the Republicans out here need to fundraise because Katie Hill is such a almost like well a funded. monumental, well funded. Uh, political figure, and especially because well, she, she's on she will the news be now, every yeah. day. Yeah. yeah, so she's already raised half a million dollars, more than that. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, is having three candidates in the race already? Maybe even a fourth one who hasn't. Uh, I think the last one is something Patron, Michael Patron. There will be more Patron. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's there may be four. There may even be more. Mm-hmm. How are these? four, five, six candidates going to fundraise and edge each other out in a primary, a jungle primary? Yeah, it's a great question. I, because Vyadaris was at the time that I interviewed her, the only candidate in the race, I didn't really get a chance to ask her, but I did ask Garcia about Vyadaris and he told me he didn't really know anything about her. So I'm not too sure um, if the Republicans are necessarily strategizing against one another and trying to figure out ways to edge each other out. But it seems like the consensus right now is more just Katie Hill is bad, so vote for me. <laughs> which is, which is awfully really simplistic. Oh, but, oh, okay. I mean, that, that was kind of the main theme that I took away from both interviews, was that Katie Hill is bad, she's doing our district a disservice, you need to vote for me so that we can turn this around and we can get affordable health care and fix the border, which are both super broad and don't really involve any any explicit policy. Right. So it, it, I think it'll be very interesting to see how the Republicans end up starting to come out against each other. Mm-hmm. Because so far, all they've really done is deride Katie, Katie Hill. Hill. But at yeah. the end of the day, she's, I mean, I think we can say she's pretty much a lock. To make it out of the jungle primary, she's going to be probably. the top two. She'll probably about win. like night was a lot because they're Republicans, the last, yeah. right? Right. So they're really fighting for that one spot. So I think right now they've made it all clear that they're not Katie Hill, that they're different from Katie Hill. But now, how is Mike Garcia better than Suzette Fiadares, or why should I vote for Suzette Fiadares and not Mike Garcia? And yeah. I think that's going to be a huge question 
that they're going to need to sort of figure out and start articulating moving forward. Yeah, I get the impression from both everything that I've read from these these two so far is that oh, you know, I couldn't, I had to get off the sidelines and do something, right? Do conservatives feel like like they had some big wake up call when Katie Hill took this, you know, turned the district blue? It's well, it wasn't just Katie Hill; it was Christy Smith. It was we did a really we seriously turned this place blue. But um, do conservatives did they wake up the next day and go, oh wow? Like wake up, like like us liberals did when Trump Trump. got elected. You know, I mean that was hard. Yeah, Brian Kafaria lost. Trump won. That was horrid. You know, do conservatives feel the same way? Like, oh my God, that we're not in a red district anymore. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I don't. I'm not a conservative per se, so I can't attest to that. I would say I think. Nowadays, congressional elections especially are going to be really tethered to national politics Mm -hmm. and really tethered to the presidency. I think we're past the days of as long as a representative performs well on the local level, they'll be sort of insulated, I guess you could say, Mm -hmm. from what's going on at the national level. Like, I think Buck McKeon was fine for so long because he was performing for the district. He probably so, could have kept going. So he, he probably could have. Yeah. So I, I, I don't think what, I, I think what opposition presidents, I, I don't think what, with them too many what Bill no Clinton or, a, or a Barack Obama were doing really mattered that much as long as he kept performing. But I think, I think now parochial politics is national. And I think I, I wouldn't be surprised to keep seeing more, more swings. The Democrats are in power now. Who knows how people are going to feel about that in one year for the the 2020 election or in three years for 2022. I think a lot of that's going to depend on what happens at the national level. I think figures like Ocasio-Cortez, Ilhan Omar, um, with whom Katie Hill sometimes has photos taken and has interactions with on Twitter in a purple district. And I think... I, I think the district's going to be more capricious. I don't think it's going to be all Republicans for a long period of time. I don't think there's going to be a Democratic hegemony. I think we're going to see more swings as we move forward. In the previous election, Katie Hill was getting slammed with uh, attack ads saying that she was taking outsider money from out, from D.C. This is, a re- this is, of course, a reference to Pelosi and the National Democratic Party. Um, Steve Knight, by contrast, was not fundraising nearly to the level of anything to match Katie Hill locally or even uh, getting help from the RNC. So if four candidates are running against each other in this district, what sort of enthusiasm are they to expect fundraising wise? How are they going to fund their campaigns in order to get out of the primary in a strong enough position if Steve Knight couldn't do it? And where's the whole mechanism that got Buck McKean elected? Is someone going to reactivate that potential donator base, or how is it? I don't really see any enthusiasm. I'm here. not sure that base exists here anymore. I agree. I was I was going to say the answer is no. I think I, so, I think that yeah. that Knight or not Knight McKeon benefited from the the high we were on after the first Gulf War. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of we wrecked a lot of shit, so we had to go to Palmdale and get Lockheed and Boeing to build some more stuff, and that's more jobs, and yeah. you know it, it fed the machine. So I mean, and so for years after that, we were we were doing great, and then you know with Bill Clinton, you know, in charge of the the economy, he made it better, and that everybody was high on the hog. So okay, let's keep Buck McKee, and you might be part of us. What's happening? So, right, um, but. I mean, I think that we're trending more and more liberal. I mean, as just as a society, you know, it's like your gay marriage is legal, and you know, we're getting legal weed now, and it's everything that happens. We're trending more and more liberal, especially here in California. So, um, the Republican Party, and I, I even talked to a couple of uh, Republican city council candidates. And even they were saying, you know what, that the party's not going to be putting any money into this district anymore. They just, it's a, it's a no win. It's a lost cause, would they say? Yeah. They think it's a lost cause. So, um, I'm like, well, 
That's funny you say that when we have five Republican city council, city council members. members. Yeah. But, you know, okay. Yeah. They're <laughs> but nonpartisan. Yeah, yeah, but, <laughs> you know, that's, a, yeah, they think, you know, for a, um, for a congressional and for state assembly type, and once Wilkes out of the state senate, I mean, they assume that he's going to go down to a Democrat next time, too. Actually, a lot of them assume that Wilk is going to run for Congress against Katie. I would not be surprised by that. I think he's a significantly candidate. higher quality candidate than anyone who's in the race than right anyone now. else. Yeah. And I, I think sort of the, the running joke is that Cameron Smythe is going to run. <laughs> and even though that, that's almost kind of a meme, it's like... I think he's actually not a bad candidate. He's not I would, terrible. I, I think Smythe is a, is a likable guy. I think he, he does a good job of connecting with voters. I like. I don't think I Smythe think he would wouldn't it. be a he terrible. Do it. I think he's his wife won't let I, him. I'm do not. It. Yeah, I, I think sorry. he's. I think he's a little too reluctant. I don't think he'd actually throw his hat his hat in the ring. Right. But I think if he were to, I don't think he'd be a bad candidate. Right. I mean, he would I be think. qualified as yeah. well. As, uh, yeah, Wilk would, but he would have to yeah. be Wilk, running. He would I think be Wilk running would be as a, a stronger candidate. He'd be running as a bachelor, yeah. Because his, yeah. I'm pretty sure his wife would leave him. But <laughs> yeah, but but back to your question, I I think the kind of what I was saying earlier. I think as local politics become nationalized, mm-hmm. that sort of McKeon model is done. It's fading it's to strong. a degree, yeah, yeah. And, and and I think funding certainly confers an advantage. And so Hill definitely has a huge advantage in that she's undoubtedly going to be able to out fundraise the competition. I mean, she had, I think it was a week ago or two weeks ago, she had Ocasio-Cortez send out a tweet with like a link for her campaign contributions. And like, Ocasio-Cortez, lover or hater, she's got millions and millions uh, of Twitter Twitter followers. yeah. Yeah. So she's very firmly entrenched in the national political arena. At this point, so I, I think there's no hope at outfunding her. I think that's that, that's over before it begins. Right. But I do think she is very much in danger of maybe not in 2020, but in the long run of really mooring herself to the Democratic political establishment. Mm-hmm. I mean, running for leadership, that's great. That's great that she got that post. But she also just linked herself to Nancy Pelosi right, right. off the bat, which... Yeah doesn't necessarily reflect well in a purple district. A lot of people here see Nancy Pelosi almost as like this boogeyman, like, oh, Nancy Pelosi, she's out to get us. So like when you, one of your first moves is to connect yourself to her, that, that doesn't play well. I don't, I don't really understand that anyway, because I think they, it's not they necessarily really hate Nancy moves. Pelosi, but you know what? She's the only one keeping the, yeah. the Bernie Sanders <laughs> and the AOCs right, right. at bay. Yeah, that woman right. has a whip and controls her caucus, but she's she's right. the, the voice of temperance right now. And I don't understand. They want to, what, let... AOC go nuts and have her right. I, I just think know. she. I think she's assorting with nationally prominent figures who, on one hand, are going to help her with fundraising. So when the high is high, it's going to be really high. But as soon as public opinion starts to turn against these people, which it inevitably it will, will, because they're yeah. they're because national figures, the and this goes might not be in 2020. It might not be in 2022. It could be somewhere down the line. Where, you know, even if the Democrats win, there's eventually going to be another Republican ascendancy. That's just how it works. Right. Out here, it doesn't and I even, think, out here doesn't even need to be necessarily a close race. It could yeah, just be that I Democrats think that's, just yeah. don't show up to vote because yeah. they don't really care. And I think, I think it's dangerous to align yourself with those people rather than focus on a really district-heavy message, which is what I think Buck McKeon did and what drove his success for a long time. And I think Knight tried to emulate that and maybe failed in some certain areas and was sort of a casualty of this new shifting landscape. I just don't remember seeing Knight for congressional do elections. No. Yeah, and, and I think that was kind of the problem. I think he was also in office at this sort of turning point. I think it's yeah. fair to say that congressional elections are a lot more national than they were ten years ago, for example. Mm-hmm. And I think I think his loss was very much a referendum on Trump, mm-hmm. yes. irrespective of, Absolutely. I don't think he was a great congressman. I think you're right. I think there were some deficiencies, but I think that was more Santa Cruz's opinion on Trump 
Right. And I could see that same opinion being transposed onto Pelosi or AOC or whoever the Democratic leader is with with whom Hill's aligned in the future. And so I think it's helping her a lot right now. I think it's probably going to push her to a win in 2020. If I were to bet, I'd put money on her despite being a moderate myself. But I think it could come back to bite her in the long run. I agree completely. I, I think that as long as Trump's in office, I think we can count on the blue team to kick some ass. This marks the end of our show. A special thank you to California Institute of the Arts for sponsoring the show. To Brennan Dixon for writing the feature on Mike Garcia and the Santa Cruz Signal. To Ryan Painter for writing the feature on Suzette Valadares and the Proclaimer SCV. And to the artist Mitro for creating the music used to create this podcast. Please join us next time on Santa Clarita in the Middle.